In my last video, I spoke about the things that you can do for an inmate while he's incarcerated to make his time a little bit easier. I left out an important one, though. You can write a letter, but not to him, rather on his behalf, perhaps to the administration. You could write his counselor. A counselor is a pretty important person in the life of an inmate. This is the guy who decides what prison you're going to go to. He decides what job you're going to get. He decides whether you're eligible for some programs that could get you out early. He's also very overworked. Correctional counselors deal with hundreds of inmates. So a short letter, just something like, Sir, I know you're very busy, but if you happen to have an extra five minutes to look into this inmate's file, if there is anything you can do to help him, I would appreciate it. It doesn't sound like much, but a letter like that from a friend or family member, it can do a lot of good. You don't need to stop at writing a counselor. You could write the captain of the yard he's on. You could write the warden of the prison. You could write a congressperson if you want. You can just say, I wanted to draw your attention to this inmate and how hard he's trying or how well he's rehabilitating himself. Of course, this is probably a good time to point out that before you draw the attention of the administration to an inmate, you do want to talk to him and make sure he wants the attention of the administration. Many inmates would rather just uh, not be noticed. A letter really can make the difference, though. I've told the story about whenever I was in San Quentin, in Badger section, and I was trying to figure out a way to get out of San Quentin's Badger section because it was a bad place. This was a reception yard. Most people were there for three months, and I got out of there in 35 days. I was explicitly told the reason they got me out of there so quickly was because of the letters that my friends and family had sent in, asking how come I had to be in that prison instead of one that was a little less dangerous. I don't want to put too much on it. Plenty of people went through Badger Section and didn't have anything bad happen to them. I was scared there, and I was really grateful that my friends and family helped get me out of there as quick as they could to some place not just less terrible, but safer, too. Of course, there is a risk to writing letters to counselors, captains. If you set out to annoy them into do some doing something, I'll just keep writing until they do fill in the blank. You can result in making an inmate's life harder instead of easier. Nobody likes to be annoyed. Generally speaking, the administration won't respond to a letter or a 602 or something on paper, you know, by taking you into a closet and beating the hell out of you, unless it was personal, unless you were 602ing an officer, or unless it was a letter insulting an officer or something like that. Another occasion upon which a letter sent in to the captain of the yard that I was on on this occasion really made a difference to me. I was going into committee after I rolled up and became SNY. You don't just leave an active yard to drop out of the gang and go up to a cop and say, hey, I've thought about it and I don't want to be in the gangs anymore, so could I sell up with a pedophile? And they just move you in with a piece of garbage over on the SNY yards that night. It would be a disaster if they did. People would manipulate that system to hurt people they hated. Instead, they evaluate you. It can take weeks, months, and it's a small trial. They're going to go through your file and make sure that you should be sent to this yard, that you have a legitimate safety concern. You're not just making something up. However, in addition to that, what they're going to do is they're going to consider whether you need to be debriefed, which is whenever the gang unit actually pulls you aside and investigates you in depth to see what criminal connections you have. It can be a process. It can take months or a year. It's a lengthy interrogation, and nobody wants to endure it. There was no reason I should be debriefed whenever I rolled up and went S and Y. I didn't have a heavy gang involvement. There's nothing they were going to get from me. But my counselor had told me that they were considering requiring everybody who left the yard at this time to go through the debriefing process. And that I was going to be the guy that was probably going to go and be debriefed even though I didn't need to be. I reached out to my friends and family, told them I didn't want to have to go through this, that Becoming SNY, feeling like my life was in danger, that was enough. I didn't want to have to go through the debriefing process on top of that. They sent some letters to my counselor, to the captain, asking why this was going to be necessary. 
One letter that I got was from an acquaintance of my family, Tom Cahill. He's prison famous, I suppose is what you'd say. He founded the Prison Rape Elimination Foundation. This is the Priya group who did the candy bar video, if you're actually familiar with some of the stuff that goes on in prison. And he included in his letter a picture of him shaking hands with President Bush whenever the law had been enacted. So it added a little bit of clout to my request to not be sent to the debriefing process for no reason. I don't know if this was the thing that made the difference. If we're being honest, I kind of suspect that they were just trying to leverage the threat of debriefing to see if I'd give them something, to see if I knew some information I'd try and trade to get out of it. But what happened was that at the committee, my counselor, who I, I guess didn't realize that the situation had changed, was reading through my file and said, and we suggest that he's going to be sent to the debriefing process. The captain actually had physically looked at the letter that had been sent in over the course of the committee, and I think he knew what was going to happen before he even stepped into the room because he overrode the counselor, which I'd never seen done, having the highest ranking person in the room say, no, we're going to go do it this way and I don't care what you people think. But that's exactly what he did. He overrode the recommendations of the committee and sent me right to the SNY, SNY yard. It was a PMU is what it's called, a placement management unit. It wasn't quite as high as a protective housing unit, like where they have Charles Manson and people like that, but it was a relatively secure environment. A letter really can make the difference. In my last video, I said that whenever you send a letter to an inmate, what you're doing is you're reminding them that they're not forgotten, that they have a resource. You're doing the same thing whenever you send a letter to a member of the administration, a correctional counselor perhaps, but you're reminding that person that the inmate hasn't been forgotten. Prison can be a scary place, and one of the reasons why is that they have absolute control over how isolated you are. If they don't want you to talk to people, right people, they can control that. They can't control who remembers you, who will pay attention if something bad happens to you. A letter from outside letting them know that you're not forgotten about, it's a big deal. It can really make the difference. I remember whenever I got to study psychiatry, I was fascinated with the idea of a social network. The idea that there is this invisible connection between ourselves and all of our friends and family and their friends and family, that it creates a web that whenever we're under pressure, whenever something goes wrong, it supports us. It stops us from breaking. It's a beautiful thought, and especially in the context of prison, that that social network still exists and it's what stops them from being able to isolate you completely. Just take a moment. Think about your social network, all those connections, friends, family, their friends and family, all the little relationships that you have that in a real way define your place in this world. I know there's hundreds of them and it's not like you can go and shake everybody's hand and tell them how important they are to you. Your cousin's friend that you talked to one time a couple of weeks ago, it's not a priority. But do just take a moment and consider the depth of those connections, how many people know you at least a little, care about you at least a little. Life's hard, scary, we all get to feeling alone sometimes. Next time you feel alone, take that moment. Think about your social network and those connections, because we aren't alone.